one of the mem one colleague, Norm Pace, at the University of Colorado in Boulder, listened to me talk about mycobacteria in showers. This was a single situation that Mike Eisman led me to when we sampled and proved that this woman was infected from the micro from mycobacterium avium in her shower. Well, he had his students go around the United States. They collected over, a, over 500 shower heads, swabbed them out, and isolated DNA, and then from, amplified the DNA of a particular sequence, sequenced it so they could identify all the microorganisms in that shower head. He is one of the next generation microbiologists and molecular biologists. Well, he found in 70% of the shower heads in the United States non-tuberculous mycobacteria and 30% had mycobacterium avium. Well, I looked at his paper because it, it struck me as what a great thing we should have been doing this all along. And I started reading it, and he had a great graphic presentation showing the various areas that he'd sampled and by color how many sequences had Mycobacterium avium and a bunch of other organisms. Of course, I was focused only on Mycobacterium avium, which was the first column, which was by far the most prevalent. But there was another group of organisms called methylobacteria. Methylobacteria are pink pigmented bacteria. Pink pigmented bacteria. Norm had earlier shown that they were prevalent in shower curtains. He has been studying the organisms that surround humans. Most recently, he went to the subways in New York City and collected samples and is reported on the microflora of the New York subways. Well, what about these methylobacteria? They are common waterborne bacteria. They are hydrophobic, mm. just like the mycobacteria. They are unrelated to the mycobacteria. There are high numbers on, sh on shower curtains. But what I found out of his paper, if the methylobacteria were present, there were no NTM. If the NTM were present, there were no mycobacteria. So I'd ask you now, is your shower curtain or shower pink? Or the shower door, anything. Now, because we were working with Dr. Landy and we had patient samples, here is a result of looking at 153 patient samples. Up here we have mycobacterium present and absent in the total number. Here we have methylobacteria present and absent. What I want to show you is out of 42 samples where the methylobacteria were present, 32 or 76% 76 didn't have mycobacteria. By contrast, if the mycobacteria were present, 86% of samples didn't have methylobacteria. That's a pretty, that's actually statistically significant if you do the right kind of statistics. We've carried that further. We've shown that mycobacteria and methylobacteria will exclude one another if they're already on a surface. So if you grow mycobacteria, mycobacterium avium on a pipe material surface, and you add methylobacteria, they're going to, very few are going to attach, and vice versa. Now, this idea came from my colleague in civil and environmental engineering, Amy Pruden, who has an idea of talking, she's now talking about a probiotic for plumbing. We tried all kinds of chemical, physical changes, and with those will still be attempted, but and I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to start selling um, methylobacteria to add to your drinking water. Uh, we're not at that stage yet. But could we not add or do something to encourage the growth of the methylobacteria and thereby reduce the growth of the mycobacteria? Yeah. 
Now, what don't we know? We don't, I don't know anything about methylobacteria. They're very recently described. Um, they have been primarily identified and described because they cause infection in HIV-infected patients. But you might know already that HIV-infected patients are very susceptible. We don't know what factors influence the presence. Are there other plumbing bacteria that influence the presence of mycobacteria? Could we, in fact, take advantage of that? And that's where Amy and we are now starting to look at the entire population and mimicking the kinds of studies that Norm Pace did. Now last, and, I, and uh, I'm getting a little bit, I, I'll, I'm leaving now the pink pigmented bacteria, but I want you to be aware of something that Richard Wallace brought to my attention and we've, we've, been, we've been working on now for some time. The Mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC as we refer to it, includes four subspecies and seven other species. For example, Mycobacterium intracelluliri is one of the species in the M. avium complex. M. avium complex, complex is a word that's kind of ill-defined and used to, to literally mean, ah, oh, we have some related organisms, we don't know how closely related they are, we don't know how closely tied they are, but we have a whole bunch. I've always worried about lumping them together when, because many of the treatment strategies for particularly the MAC were developed during the AIDS era when we were treating primarily Mycobacterium avium because AIDS patients very seldom get any of the other subspecies and they very rarely get M. intracelluliri. Are we missing something in terms of antibiotic combinations? Are we missing something in terms of clinical signs if now we segregated patients into those infected with M. avium and those with intracellulary? Now, Richard called me one day and said, Joe, and he's always very diplomatic and he's, his, his heart is always in the right place. And I've never doubted that from the minute I met this young man in Kansas City, right? at an ATS meeting. He said, Joe, all your isolates of M. intracellulari that you isolated from water are really a related species, Mycobacterium chimera. Ooh. Now, he was very gentle and he said, Joe, we all identify them the same way. Everybody's been making this mistake. It's not just you. You haven't goofed up. It's the method because these organisms are so closely related, the method that we use will, will not distinguish between the two. Well, we've looked now at 29 isolates, maybe more. Richard probably has more in, the, in his notebook there. But none of our water intracellular isolates are really intracellular, but they're chimeric. Mycobacterium intracellular doesn't come from water. We've been lumping it in with avium because we get avium from water, but I've always been troubled by the fact that I've never been able to match an M intracellulari from water with an M intracellulari from a patient, even though the water, water came from the patient's house or they exposed to it. Very simply, friends, because I was comparing two different species. Of course they differ. So I do think that intracellulari comes from soil. Think. So be careful. Be careful. Joe thinks a lot, and sometimes he thinks really wrong. But I'm also worried about the other MAC species. I just recently, with a colleague in Brazil, she looked at non tuberculous mycobacterial infection, infected patients in Brazil. Now, Brazil is at an intermediate stage in terms of what mycobacteriologists look as in, in the world. There's the tuberculosis world, such as Africa, India, China, where you have lots more cases of M tuberculosis infection, classic tuberculosis, than NTM disease. In fact, you don't even see NTM disease. In the United States, Europe, Japan, Australia, you see NTM disease and very little TB. But what about a place like Brazil where the environment 
the social conditions are improving. There, the dilemma is distinguishing between TB infection and NTM infection. And they are right at that, and Roberta Fusco is right there doing that kind of work. Well, they have a terrific laboratory, and they found a lot of an organism that I'm relatively unfamiliar with called Mycobacterium massiliense in Brazil. Well, the question is, why massiliense? Well, I realize that it's closely related to abscesses. And that, too, like this little story here, we may have patients who've been infected, who have been diagnosed with abscessus infection, but it might be Mycobacterium massiliense. Richard is going to talk about the importance of the laboratory. All right? This is one of those things. And, and Richard and I have talked about real translational medicine, the kinds of the data that we can derive, obtain, that will then guide physicians and patients in what they're doing. All of you are trying or are already very educated in mycobacterial disease, and I admire you for that and the fact that you've taken control of your disease and you just don't go in and say, tell me what to do, I'll do it, all right? That is not going to work with mycobacterial disease. When I talked about filters, I learned that from one of our patients. When I talked about the refrigerator, I learned it from the son of one of our patients. I get ideas from you. I'm here to listen not only to the physicians, but also any idea. My email was on the very first slide. Doot, 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 doot. I answer emails. There's Fern. There's Joe's email. There's my lab web page. Ask us questions. Pin us down. It's all right to tell me, no, Joe, you know, I don't think you've proven this. I'm not sure I'm going to do this. I'm not going to change my hot water heater. Well, that's good. We'll prove it. Mike, Ken, Richard, and others always ask me good questions. So, now, I think we have questions at the end, right? Okay, so I am finished. Kind of on time, I'm sorry. <laughs>